Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, I'm going to talk about the folly and the stupidity of youth. Now, uh, I've touched upon this a little bit over a few videos over the past sort of few weeks. I've mentioned it here or there. I've uh, also mentioned it in live streams as well from time to time. And um, it is very true that when we're young, we have such follies and we have such stupidity. I myself am a perfect example of this. Now, the folly of youth is in its ignorance. It's no secret that that's the case. Um, like with myself or with many other people out there who are, who are young, they jump onto the scene in a very, very spirited manner and they think, yes! I know what this is. I'm going to uh, stand up and say my piece and I'm going to say it better than the generation before me. It's an obvious thing whenever we talk about youth and whenever we talk about young people um, sort of coming through and learning their craft, that's the thing that, that springs to mind. We see it more uh, prominently on social media, on now with YouTube and things like that. We have a lot of... Uh, sort of 20 something people like myself or even just uh, you know sort of in their late teens come on to youtube do videos about all manner of different subjects and you see it in their eyes and you see it in the speech um they think they know they think they're 45 they think they're 55 they think they're a master of their craft they think they understand all the intricacies of all these sorts of things and um they think they understand life and they've been through the ringo and all this sort of stuff and and uh so that kind of thought process lends themselves to um kind of having this uh arrogance which also is a falsehood and almost gives them a, a false twang of they're trying to be genuine or they think they're all this but actually they're not and the the real horror in that is that they believe it and you can see it in their speech and you can see it in their eyes that they believe they're all this they believe that they're 45 or they're 50 or or that they've got let's say they don't believe they they are 45 or 50 literally but they believe that they've got the ability of someone 45 or 50 and of course i'm making an allegory of myself as well here and i want to draw that back as well to myself because um obviously that's a part of myself that I portray and people will no doubt see me in that way from time to time. Um, and so to someone who's 50, I must be intolerable. I must be absolutely intolerable. And, and indeed, when I'm 50 and I'm seeing this kid on YouTube who's 20 odd or who's 18 or whatever age it may be that that person is who's saying all this, I'll be like, oh God, you just don't understand, you know, so there's... Um, there's a real stupidity in youth. It's just a, a horrendous experience. I've all, often thought that it would be good, and even in this idea, I'm kind of showing my uh, very spirited nature coming through, thinking that I'm doing things better than the previous generation by drawing up new or quasi-new uh, philosophical concepts, um, in which I've often thought it would be brilliant if we flipped life on its head, if... For example, if biologically we were born old and then die, you know, like a Benjamin Button type thing, because um, I think that that would give us, or even if we were to be just generally be old, have the demeanour of being old when we were young and young when we were old or something like that, because it's like we have all this spiritedness, we have all this kind of desire and getting out there and all the rest of it, whereas... It's not the time, it's not the, you've not kind of grown into life enough to have that. But of course, old people, they've grown into life enough, but they don't have it anymore because they've lost the spirited nature of youth. And they're the ones who need it the most. It's like um, Freud's quote, um, if the old knew, no wait, if youth knew 
if age could. That's the quote. If youth knew, if age could. And that is exactly right, you know. Um, if, for example, I had all of the crystallised intelligence, all of the, the knowledge um, that someone's gained over a lifetime, at, let's say 75, if I had that knowledge now with the, the spirited youth that I've got as well, it'd be perfect, it'd be awesome. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Now, imagine if we did have it the opposite way around, where we kind of started off with the demeanour of an old person and just that nice, kind, grown, well, you know, the stereotypical nice old person, let's say, because there's loads of different shades of old people, and actually there's a lot of people who are like 70-odd who are just horrible people, um, and, and life has just made them cruel and miserable and all that, and they've not realised the, the, the mellowing of life and all that sort of stuff, which is the in my personal philosophical opinion, the correct way to age is which you understand uh, the flow of life and understand the challenges of life and just start to accept whatever comes your way. And then when you, as you get older and older and older, you mellow and mellow and mellow more. Um, and my granddad, particularly one of my granddads, my, my dad's dad, really liked this, like so just accepting of whatever comes his way now he's you know he's like eight, is he 82 I think he's 82 now so he's really you know at that stage where he's just mellowed and whatever happens he's just he's very calm he's very centered he'll just deal with it in a very present fashion um and and so uh that's kind of when I think about that idea of mellowing in life I always consider my granddad because obviously I have that personal association um but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people who, who are like miserable and all the rest of it when they're older. And I mean, it's fair enough because you think to yourself, well, you know, entropy exists. They, they full well, I mean, when you get to 70, you know, you've not got long left. So you're like, what, what is there to be happy about? Really? You know, your organs are starting to fail you. Your health is going down. Uh, you know, just generally your health is going down, mental health, physical health, whatever, because um, your mental health may deteriorate with your physical health. Um, and, you know, all the rest of it. So what do they really have to be happy about? So then you think, well, OK, I understand that you're miserable. I understand that, uh, you know, you, you kind of have the right to be because you've got the external stimulus there to, to have that right. Um, although, to be honest, it would be better if you had accepted your fate in a different way. Um, and Socrates talks about the idea of philosophy being able to be something that helps you accept your ultimate demise. Um, whether I actually believe in that, um, I'm not certain. There's some philosophers that have contested it. I think Nietzsche was one of the philosophers who contested that idea. Uh, it might have been Nietzsche or it might have been someone else, but there's many different philosophers over time. Some who've agreed with that and then others who haven't. Um, personally, I don't know where I sit on it yet. I think my opinion will change uh, as the years go on, but... Um, but no, anyway, you have that, let's say we go back to this idea of being old first off and then young. You have that old demeanour when, you, when you're first born, let's say, and over the first 30, 20, 30 years of life. And then you are building up all your knowledge with that beautiful, accepting, present, kind demeanour that is associated with the mature and mellowed older person. Uh, but then by the uh, sort of the... Um, end of your life when you're younger um because well let's say we're doing it in the benjamin button fashion so it's not only that you have an old demeanor but that maybe you're growing backwards as well so then when you're uh older but technically younger biologically in the benjamin button thing um you would be a person who's kind of had all of that accumulation of knowledge in the period where you're mellow and all the rest of it, and then you've got the spiritedness, but you've got the spiritedness of youth with all of the knowledge that you've gained over your life. So then you would have both. You'd have the best of both worlds. But then what, even in that situation, what you would realise is that the spiritedness of youth, you would actually grow to be more immature. So therefore, you may have the knowledge, but you'd end up be growing backwards and becoming more immature in the process. So it's like, yeah, okay, maybe that wouldn't work as well. But um, 
it might work better than what we've got. I'm not I'm not certain. Um, but then you do think in this, these ideas, when you think about these ideas, you think, well, maybe nature has put it in such a way that is the most efficient way, even if we can't see it as thus, even if we see it as actually, you know, not very efficient, or if we see it from our sort of micro viewpoint with the knowledge that we can understand, that we can perceive of, of life and of the process of life and of um, nature and the universe and stuff, you know, maybe we see it as inefficient, but actually is the best way or is something of the best way um, about it. Maybe it is that we do have to have the spiritedness of you first gain the follies of that spiritedness and not have much intelligence at first and then through the years gain that intelligence and be more centered i think really the the, the kind of the really sweet spot is like your mid to late 40s because you've still got you know you still got your body you can still use your body and all the rest of it and even like you could argue 50s a little bit as well um but in that time period, you still got your body. You can still utilize it to a fair degree, um, but you've got a bit more experience there. So that kind of time is very, very powerful, very, very crucial time. And I think um, for anyone, regardless whether you're a philosopher or whether you, whatever field you are, I think it's important to. Well, maybe not with whatever field. This is it, with the exclusion of uh, anything physical, like sports and things like that, because. It, it works differently with uh, athletes because, of course, athletes retire a lot earlier and then, you know, it means that their 40s or their 50s is, is more really like their 60s because in, in terms of their career. Um, but with most subjects, I think it's very, very important to use the spiritedness of youth to uh, have that fervour and that passion for what you're doing and, and absorbing as much as you can and also making your follies with regards to just general life experiences and going out there and having general life experiences that maybe you would consider as you know being quite stupid but actually those are the things that really give you the wisdom um and then when you get to your 40s or your 50s you've you've got for one, you've had you've really been very um, absorbed in your knowledge in your field for a good like twenty years or so, and you've really used your your young brain to attack knowledge. But also, you've got uh, a more wise understanding of life through having experiences that you um, now know to be kind of stupid, but that actually, if you didn't do them, you'd never have under really got that wisdom or got that understanding to the fullest degree. It's why I would say to my kids, actually, and I know we see not, of course, when they're young, but when they hit a certain age, I'd be like, go out there and just make loads of mistakes. I don't, I don't care. So long as you don't like kill yourself, just make mistakes, do alcohol, do like weed or something. If you want to do weed, do whatever, you know, all these little things, have sexual experiences, whatever sexual experiences you want. If you don't want loads of sexual experiences, don't do it, but just you, you do it as you want to do it uh, and just go out there, but just make sure you keep in contact with me, you know, when you're going out for a night or whatever, make sure you don't bloody die. That's, you know, that's my rule. Don't die. But do these things because these are the things that are going to make you uh, wise. Because I know it sounds stupid, like how the hell does doing alcohol make you wise? But think about it, because if you never did alcohol and you were like 45, having never drank, and then someone gives you a drink. You don't know your bloody limits and you're 45. What have you done with your life? You know, or you think, well, I mean, there's, there's the argument for sex for with regards to um, actually, you know, complexes involved with sex as well. But, you know, it may be you're 40 or you're 50 and you ne you've never had sex. You've not opened up that dimension of life and you've become close to... Um, that particular instinct within you because it's a compulsion it's a desire it's a need um and so uh that can be very very harmful as well because it can uh, and it's something that i know all too well from personal experience it can disintegrate with your um 
personality and it can be uh, it can be quite a bad thing now of course if someone's had a healthy development even if they are 40 or 45 and have not had sex it's not going to be an incredibly psychological uh, psychologically negative thing um but still it's a dimension of experience that you've not had and therefore you've not been able to integrate with it imagine that every single experience in life is a process of integration within your own personality so if you don't do something it's something that you may you've not had the experience of and therefore you may be closed off to imagine it like that so if the more and more you don't do alcohol or you say no to alcohol, the more and more you build up a mild, might be a mild at first and then a moderate aversion to it. And then that's something in your personality that you've not actually kind of taken ownership of and, and, and kind of integrated with. So even if you just did it once in your life or even if you just did it a few times in your life and said, right, that's not for me, at least you've done it and then you've closed, you've opened up that personality and thought, side of your personality or side of, of experience and then you thought, no, actually, it's not for me, that's fair enough. But if you never do it and, you re and also you actively reject it, then you're building up an aversion to it that might become harmful. Um, so I, that's why I would say to like my kids, I say, go out there, have these experiences because it's opening up dimensions of yourself and you're also experimenting with what you like and what you don't like and who you actually are because there's certain people who it is kind of within their personality or it's a part of their personality to have certain things that they do more of they have a propensity towards now whether that's a good thing or a bad thing in terms of what that particular behavior is well that's just what it is you know um Obviously, we've got to make the argument for the fact that uh, if someone's like crazy drinking or crazy smoking or crazy doing this, or crazy doing that, then that could fall into addiction and then that needs a treatment of itself. But certainly there's certain things, certain behaviours that people naturally lend themselves towards and that becomes a part of their personality it becomes a part of who they are how they're recognized we see this also in dress sense and things like that so again it would be an uh, it would be something that i would encourage my kids to do to experiment with their dress sense and say well look let's i'll give you all these clothes what do you like out of these what who who are you in your in your dress sense because it's about finding your individualized expression of personality um, f throughout all these experiences, throughout all these different dimensions and being able to uh, have these experiences, accept the ones and, and filter in the ones to who you are and keep those ones and then reject the others that just simply aren't who you are or that are harmful and that you don't particularly want to in in indulge in them too much. Um, so, Therefore, um, doing that, you get to, you get to understand a bit more of who they are and a bit more of how they want to move through life. And of course, you, you let's say in the idea of um, certain behaviours, such as, for example, um, someone uh, has experiences with drinking and then they go down this kind of route of, of drinking quite a lot or they go down this route of you know, just they've got a bit more of a behave, what we'd call a behavioral excess of drinking alcohol. Uh, maybe not quite to the level of addiction, or maybe to the level of addiction, it doesn't really matter. But you see, even doing something like that, or even having that experience, if that individual can combat that and get over that, it then also integrates their personality and allows other parts of their personality to flourish as well now unfortunately not everyone can fully get over addiction and there's a lot of people out there who have had addictions and they say that they've got over it but actually it's still working in their mind they're they're still addicted to the ideas of, of the addiction so for example what i mean by this is okay you have someone with an alcohol addiction and they get over it and well they kind of get over it they what you would call you would you would call it in a psychological sense of kind of got over the addiction because they don't really do it to the extent that they once did it, but maybe they still let's say they are a drinker they have been quite a heavy drinker maybe they still drink, and you can see it in their eyes it's a very empirical observation, um, but you can see it when someone's been an alcoholic for a long time, and then they speak about drinking 
You automatically know that we're addicted to the thought still. We're addicted to the thought of alcohol, to the thought of having a drink. And so it's not fully the complex there of the, the idea of the addiction that's working in their brain. It hasn't fully gone. And it might very well be that the, the addiction to the thoughts of the addiction that remain and the addiction uh, and the um, almost, uh, I was going to say the addiction to the addiction still being present. It's not quite that, but the addiction to the compulsion to still think in a certain way and maybe still go for alcohol a little bit and stuff like that, that might be a product of the fact that it simply, it was that particular behaviour of drinking maybe so behaviourally entrenched over a very, very long time period, you know, it's so cemented in the brain, um, that behaviour and that those memories, um, and those emotions with regards to those experiences with that behaviour, that that is obviously always going to be the case, that's always going to remain, they're always going to have this little look in their eye for that particular thing, whether it be a vice of smoking or drinking or whatever, they're always going to have that. Uh, it might be the case, it might be the case, but I am certain that there are many people out there who are able to get over addiction fully, like in a in a very very full capacity so it might be that those people i'm talking about are a kind of subset of a of a grouping you know of a, a tiering system within getting over addiction or or having fully got over addiction um now i've not looked into the scientific literature on addiction so i'm just speaking here from a an empirical and a philosophical viewpoint i'm not speaking wholly from a psychological viewpoint i'm speaking partially from a psychological viewpoint but not particularly, more just from um, my own ob observations on reality, really. Um, but if I was to go into it massively in a psychological viewpoint, obviously I'm speaking a little bit in that, that viewpoint because of talking about behaviourism and things like that, but I've not really looked into the uh, other like sci scientific literature on addiction or anything like that, like, like for example, the neuropsychology of addiction or anything. Um, but no, we, we have those kind of things, so... Um, but if someone can kind of get over an addiction, let's say they can get over it fully, then that can also um, open up new dimensions to their personality and it can open up new things and, and new ways of behaviour and new uh, ways to experience the world as well and, and also a newfound um, happiness and a newfound relationship with uh, people within their life and experiences in their life um, and of course, it it may remove any sort of depression or, uh, and you know, maybe there was kind of this, people kind of have this cloud of uh, depression, nihilism, this kind of just real, very negative cloud of experience over themselves when they've got something like that, when they've had something like that. And so when they come out of it, they've not got that cloud anymore. So it's almost as if there's energy, there's mental energy freed up. And so they do feel happier. They do have more energy. They do, they're able to get out there. And of course, there's ties like uh, physiologically in terms of um, obviously if, let's say, someone's been a smoker or someone's been a drinker, then smoking and drinking are obviously going to affect the, the energy they have physiologically. So when you get rid of that, then of course they're going to have more energy in that sense. Um, and of course, just their, their organism is going to work more efficiently anyway. And then that's going to um, obviously go to affect the subjective mind, the, their, their mind and the way they feel. Um, so of course, you, you've got that side of it anyway, quite logically. Um, so, um, you know, you've got that, but in terms of getting back, I suppose, to the subject and getting back to um, this kind of folly of youth, it, it, it's an odd one because, you know, we always, when we're young, there's, there's such this passion, this real drive, this desire to say, look, this is what I know, this is what I think it is, and this is where I stand, and we so get into that, and we so 
think about that and we so compel ourselves in that direction when we are young and um, there's so much of a lack of perspective and many people many of the kind of the 21st century motivational speakers and all this who are very very big on YouTube specifically Gary V and those like that speak about perspective and it's very very interesting actually as a, as a topic um, there is in young people a total lack of perspective I mean we could speak about this I'm going to do a separate video on the philosophy of death which will be very lovely video of course um, but um, I, I am going to do a separate video on this but a lot of young people have this idea that they're not going to die you know, you, you, you speak to people and you, and you talk to them and they're so entrenched in me every day. But, but like, oh, what are you doing next? Oh, what are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing? Oh, you know, all this. They're, 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 they're oblivious to it. They don't know that we're going to die. Have, have Has anyone who's young, let's say, who's 17, 18, 20, 23, whatever, my age, 25, have the really thought about death i don't just mean yeah of course well we all think about death in a fleeting manner we always think well oh i'm gonna die one day oh. ah well well you know tomorrow i'm doing this you know and so you know so you, you get that you, you get this kind of oh i'm gonna die i'm gonna die one day that's really quite odd that's really quite depressive and then something happens and then you you almost your psyche almost suppresses it or you almost suppress it immediately and you flow on with the conversation and that's and, and so when See, this is the weird thing that's never I've never understood this because I've since I was uh, thirteen or so I've always thought about death always so much and and yes it is a neurotic tendency by the way of my, myself but it's also one of the reasons why uh, it's one of the reasons that's tied to certain instincts that I'm very good at getting myself into and then those specific instincts are the very thing that have allowed me to think along with my. Uh, intelligence and stuff have been the uh, allowed me to think and be able to get to a very good level of understanding empirically about certain things that other philosophers and other psychologists have talked about so it is in one bizarre way um any level of neurotic tendencies that have and we could also discuss this in a much wider manner um in terms of other complexes and neurotic tendencies that I have which are which i won't discuss now but because uh, it, it just it just be a it's not even the video. I'd, I'd do it in another video if I was going to do it. But um, those, let's say, other complexes, other neuro neurosis I've had is actually the thing that has gone to lead me to um, being, let's say, in a zone of compulsive thinking that has allowed me to be able to uh, experience things in a higher level let's say than certain other people it's weird it's almost like my neurosis has developed a obsessive compulsive disorder that has then actually cemented itself and identified itself with intelligence and so because of that it's reinforced behaviorally reinforced itself over years and then it's meant that I uh, I have actually been able to um, have a better connection to the sub facet of the um of trait conscientiousness the big five trait conscientiousness of industriousness which um which means that i can uh, I've, I've kind of specialized for uh inquisitive intelligence on a compulsive thinking level it's incredible it's genius what 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 my neurosis has done it's the weirdest thing my neurosis is my genius I, I can't even believe it it's like ridiculous it's like it makes me question myself because i think well maybe it's my neurosis but i don't think it is because um I, I've, I've looked into it enough to discern that intelligence is quite separate from a, a neurosis but what seems to happen is that the neurosis can in cer certain circumstances reinforce intellectual um impulsivity or kind of the compulsion for intelligence which then means that uh you then kind of become 
uh, directed more intelligence and then obviously you can become wiser in the process, not only from the pain and suffering of the neurosis, but also from the intellectual in in inquisitiveness that has come as a, um, well, partially as an innate process, but also partially as reinforced from the neurotic tendency, which is very, very weird. Um, anyway, where was I at? Oh yeah, so the whole death thing. So anyway, it's always been really, really weird for me because I've thought about death from such a young age. Uh, when you, and I've had this before in conversations, and it's really, really odd. It really like, I don't like this as well because I think, why do people be so closed off to it? But anyway, uh, I've been in conversations before where someone or maybe someone else or maybe myself has brought up the situation of death and immediately people, have, certain people have this aversion to it. And like, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. But you know, that's a long time. Don't we? We don't need to talk about. It. That's just depressive. That's just, no, we don't need to talk about. It. I'm like, what? Why? It's not. De why is it depressive? Like, I don't understand. I don't see death as depressive specifically. Um, of course, there's a depressive element to it. No one's going to dispute there's some depressive element to it. But it's very, very interesting. We've been put on this planet not knowing anything, not knowing anyone, just popped out into existence. And we've got X amount of time to live. You know, it's almost as if we're in this weird video game that, like, we're, we're we, we, we're like, ready, you know, we're well, not ready player, I'm not talking about the movie Ready Player One, but it's kind of like that idea, that phrase of, like, Ready Player One. You know, it's like, are you ready? Are you ready for the game? Are you ready? You know, it's like, and it was like, you've only got X amount of time left, and you've got to get married, and you've got to have, you know, you've got the little checkpoints, and of course, that's a societal construct, you know, the ideas of getting married and getting, having kids, and there's no actual one right way to live, of course. It's very obvious that you can just do go your own way well within the confines of a society of course you can breach the rules of the society and um and then just go go out and go crazy or whatever um but if you want to live a fairly kind of regimented existence and fairly what we could deem meaningful or happy existence in some regard in in a society then you do need to live in a a slightly structured or certain way but within our society such as like that we've got in the uk or the, the kind of outline of our society the structure of our society it does although there will be a lot of people who um get stuck in this idea that you know society is a trap and there's all this i've been through that a lot i've been through that idea and i have thought about that idea a lot and i really do think that that is uh mainly a neurotic compulsion i don't think there is too much basis in that now if we're to talk about whether technology is a trap or well not a trap but is a kind of thing in which controls us yeah okay maybe there's a bit more um basis in that and then we could say well our technology at the moment is um, we, we are slowly becoming, let's say, a little bit more of slaves to technology and things like that. I mean, I'm recording a video using technology right here, thinking nothing of it, but, you know, my behaviour is compelled towards technology just unconsciously. So, you know, we could discern that and then we could branch that off and we could say, well, there's certain aspects of that that relate to certain societal structures and therefore, in a certain way, society does uh, obviously control us and orient us and yes of course there are elements to society that um control us that, that orient us and things like that but this whole idea that society is 100 percent a complete trap and that everything's against you and that everything's negative you know it's like this black or white thinking mentality like this extremist conspiracy theory type thing and that there's all this everything's brainwashing and all you know that's like no that's an erotic compulsion and also i would say an erotic compulsion or a neurotic tendency is this idea to think that you can't live in society, and I've been through this myself as well, this idea that you can't live in society because society won't accept you as an individual for, let's say, 
the the expanse of your own personality and this is something really that only people who have an expansive personality like myself or an eccentric personality a very very big bold different and there's loads of different facets to your personality it's only those people who go through this because they all always feel a bit of the outlier they always feel a bit of the the outsider um and they feel as if they're, they they don't quite fit into society but i think that that generally is um it's a childish idea as well. It's a childish expectation. We'd say in Jungian terms, it's related to certain expectation of the divine child archetype, um, the, the negative pole, the negative shadow pole of the divine child, which is the high chair, ta well, yeah, kind of the high chair tyrant. Um, and so there's this compulsion to try and make something and build something on your own. And so when you get into that and you get into a cyclical rhythm with that of thinking that society is against you and it doesn't um, allow you to express yourself enough and I can't live in society because it doesn't accept me and it's trying to stifle me and uh, my personality is more than society and all this you can see where that aggression and, and, and that would you know that would lead and where that would get you and it's the extremist version of that, let's say, that then becomes almost the fascist or becomes the um, dictator who's hell-bent on control in their specific way because their personality uh, wants uh, expression for itself um, in its specific way that's, that it thinks society doesn't accept when actually if they really were a bit more mature about it they'd realise that society does accept it and there is certain ways in which they can partake in society and actually integrate properly and, and, and enjoy an existence there and get a meaningful existence there but instead of that they, they have this personality and of course they've got aggression and all the rest of it and then they map that onto a idea of a new society of a new like utopia which really is just based on their neurotic compulsion and their neurotic psychology um and and their kind of rigid fixation on i want it this way you see in my terms what i would do if i was going to go down this route is i would uh, if I was to run a society as a dictator, everybody would be dressed in rainbow. Everybody would do X things. Everybody would be have imagination. Everybody would have creativity. I would model it on myself. And that's how it would be. And of course, there's a, uh, an egocentricity that comes with that because that is also tied to the divine child and tied to this expectation and this kind of neurotic tendency here with uh, it doesn't accept me but I'm going to make it accept me and I'm going to change it and I'm going to show it who I am you see that's a that's a, a compulsion in that way um, when the child doesn't get what when a child doesn't get what he or she wants there's always this burst of I'm going to make myself known I'm going to show them who I am um, and so, you know, generally children cry and things like that and have this burst of anger and things to get what they want. And then, of course, the parents not really being able to do anything else or feeling as if they can't really do anything else, give in to the child and then reinforce the behaviour, essentially. And then the child ends up crying and bawling and all the rest of it next time or things happen and they're, they're reinforcing um, this kind of divine like child in the child and the parents are becoming the saviors or the di divine parents or the um divini parentis i think it's called in latin um I've, i butchered the pronunciation there but there we go so um and that's a negative you see that's the the overprotective parents and of course that's the spoiled brat or the the uh, divine child as well can manifest from that and the high chair tyrant the shadow pole of the divine child can manifest from that sort of stuff as well I mean of course it's so much more complex than that it's not like oh well you know you 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 give in to your child a few times and then they're automatically this high chair tyrant or whatever it's, it's not at all like that um of, of course I'm just giving a very basic 
you know skeletal example but there's so much more that has to go in and go on in the psychology of a child and there's so many different negative things negative memories that have to swirl around them um before in their adulthood their you know their psychology is is incredibly broken or anything there has to be numerous amounts of things because the psyche is actually relatively strong even in a child you can certain things can happen to a child and their psyche can get through it. You know, it might be a bit of a rough road, but they can they can grow into an adult and they can be mature and they can be um and they can get through it and they can be they can be okay. Um and the psyche can just about manage it and maybe they need a little bit of therapy or something like that, but you know, they're, they're okay. But when you have like loads of things year after year on a child like that, then that's when it you know, rough seas. Um, uh, and it is a good comparison to rough seas. It is like that, but it's like rough seas all the time through their teenage years, through their early adulthood, just rough seas. If they don't sort themselves out, they can, and they're not, if they're not conscious of their neurosis or they're not conscious of how these complexes are affecting their behavior and they reinforce the complexes negatively, God, you better watch out for that individual. Jesus, they are gonna, they could destroy people i mean i'm not meaning they they would become a killer or anything like that although you know if it was like an extreme extreme situation it it may depend on the um obviously the functionality of their brain um as kind of a uh, maybe a genetic component maybe they've got something genetic within them maybe there's a genetic component of um a certain disorder as well that that reinforces that and they've had all this crap in their life then that would you know breed someone like that but they could hurt people in terms of being very very horrible to people they could destroy their friendships they could destroy people's lives and things like that um because of all the complexes they've got even if they haven't got a genetic association to some sort of uh disorder or whatever it may be um but uh anyway getting back to the situation so so yeah there's people who think about death you know like that but it, 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 it seems quite um interesting to me and quite um i don't know just very very uh cool to think about death and to think about well what could it be what is this what what do we experience here what do we think why do we why are we the way we are um why is it that we're born and then we get this amount of time and what is it that we need to do here and uh, do we need to be anything other than who we are or is is the point of life to express who we are and to try and find who we are what actually is it and there's a lot of interest in that but a lot of young people don't actually consider that and that's a problem because by the time you get to 40 or 50 they're not really very they're still not really that comfortable with death they you know there's there's even a lot of people in their 40s or 50s who are quite anxious about death now um and so that's kind of quite odd because you would expect you know you have this certain people would have this wrestling with death this is what should happen you have a wrestling with death in your youth and you have experiences of which uh, are challenges that you have to overcome whether physical challenges or mental challenges getting over complexes or um, doing crazy wild things um, that young people do like swimming with sharks or climbing up mountains or doing all these things and these are kind of like markers to your acceptance of death and so being able to get comfortable with these certain things and being able to overcome these things and also at the same time wrestling with the problem of death in a philosophical setting just you know occasionally here and there for the average person because obviously unless you're like someone like me who's just always you know constantly over the top going into it um but for the average person you're wrestling with it here and there um and then you get in your 40s or 50s more of an acceptance of that that's the way the the person should do it the everyday person should do it and the individual who's a philosopher or a psychologist or someone who's really looking into these things and introspecting they're they're on a different path they're on a different 
it's their job, you could say, to look into death. It's their job to really, really go down. It's, they've, they've not got a choice. If, they're, if you're a psychologist and you haven't really wrestled, or if you're a philosopher, I should say, rather than a... I mean, yes, a psychologist as well, but yeah, a philosopher as well. Both, really. Uh, but if you're a philosopher who hasn't wrestled with the problem of death to a real, incredible, ridiculous, compulsive degree, then it's not really that you've thought about philosophy. And to be honest, there isn't a philosopher out there. I mean, a true philosopher. If you're watching this and you are a true philosopher, you will have thought about death and you will have thought about it practically in the same level as I, as I, as I, have, as I have thought about it. So uh, therefore, you know, that's, and that's how it should be for the philosopher. Um, but yeah, I think that this is something that's, um, again, the stupidity of youth that Youth don't think about it. Youth don't think about death. They don't give it the attention it deserves. Death should be respected. Why should it be respected? Because we are placed in this life and we are fated. We are fated to die. There's, in our life, we're not fated to get married. We're not fated to have children necessarily. I mean, if you believe in the, the, the philosophy of fatalism, then yes, you believe that you're fated to get married or you're fated to have children. But let's remove the philosophy of fatalism for a second and just say, well, all these different things that happen in your life, you're not fated to do them. They may come, they may not come, right? But you are fated to die. Everybody dies. That's the one thing. That's the one thing. So, why shouldn't we give that respect? Why shouldn't we look into it? Why shouldn't we exactly scratch our heads about it and think, what is this thing? What is this thing? And then when we're done doing that, and when we're done thinking about it, why then don't we go out there and live for as much as it's worth to live? Because, you see, if you're going to think about death, here's the prerequisite. If you're going to think about death, you have to equally think about life as much, if not more, because death is, thinking about death, Alan Watts says this, thinking about death in the sense of what is after death, and maybe even philosophizing about the fact that there might be nothing after death, thinking about that is a creative force that allows you to live properly, that, that gives life more richness and more meaning. Just like you're putting manure on the fields to grow better crops, to have a better harvest of crops. So when you think about death, what you're doing is you're putting manure on life and making life grow better and making the crop of life more bountiful. Because if we thought that there was eternal life, it would... It would get mundane. It would get boring. We, it wouldn't be life. It wouldn't be exciting anymore. If we lived for 5,000 years, we would just waste half of that. Oh, well, I've got loads of time. I'll just, I'll, I'll maybe go to sleep. I'll have a nap. Or, you know, I'll, I'll just do a bit of, you know, some part, something or nothing today. I'll just, just go for a walk. I'm not going to do much. I'm not going to strive for anything beyond myself because, well, I've got all this time. You see what I mean? So, but when we think about death and we think, well, we've got 75 years or we've got X number of years. Obviously, it's different for different people. But we've got this amount of time. And then after that, I don't know where we're going to go. Are we going to go into nothingness? Am I going to get a new body in some sort of idea of what I've termed the ecological changeabilities in consciousness, referring to the dream time idea of um, this this idea of, well, the... Um, the, the uh, cuckoo, I think, what is it? Uh, no, cockatoo in the book that we read the other day on, uh, I think it was the experience of Zen. The cockatoo dies and obviously Wan, the crow, says it, he's not, for, as far as we know, he's he's gone, but what's happened is he may reappear somewhere else. So it might be the case that uh, our, our consciousness changes with ecology, just like our physical body our body breaks down, changes into the environment and goes in and to, to renewing something else in the environment. So does our consciousness and our consciousness may get this, be disposed, uh, get um, disposed, get, um, 
allocated, let's say, I'm trying to think of another word, but allocated will do, allocated into another animal or another thing. So we might end up being a crow or being a this or being a that, whatever, I don't know. Um, or being, I don't know, an elephant or, or a dolphin or whatever it may be. Um, so uh, that might be the case. Or maybe uh, when we die, we do go to some sort of place like heaven or hell. And can you imagine what heaven would be like and all the amazing things? And do we come back as ourselves when we're like 60? Or maybe we die at 60. Do we come back as that in heaven? Or do we come back as when we're like 21? Because I'd prefer to come back as when we're like 21. Obviously, many people have had this idea. Well, do we come back at that kind of age? Or, oh, I wonder what's there. Is there, you know, beautiful women there? Is there a selection of, of beautiful vegetables and fruits and, and meats and fishes and all this beautiful stuff there? Do we get to see God? Do we get to actually go up to what you would imagine is this fantastic, elaborate, exquisite palace with beautiful architecture that reminds you of sort of Greek architecture or Greco-Roman architecture? Um, and is there kind of uh, the, these beautiful seats that are adorned with um, wonderful upholstery and uh, beautiful colours? And do we see God sat on that throne? Is God an actual person or is it something else? Is it is it does God take the form of a computer or a bottle or does it take the form of a stone or what is it, you know, or? When we go to heaven, is it actually something different? Is heaven personalised for every single individual? So does that mean that a porn star will go to a porn star heaven and a uh, a shepherd will go to a shepherd's heaven? And we all have these personalised heavens that are like little cubicles that are cemented in a wider network of cubicles that essentially... Um, uh, uh, formulated this big, big patterning system that then is the the super heaven, essentially the super heaven, which um, is is like the formulation of all the billions and billions of of personalized little cubicle heavens. Is that the case? Um, do we go to hell? What what's hell like? Do we stay there forever? Is it eternal? Is it really eternal damnation? Do we burn in hellfire? Is that what we do? Do we see Satan himself, the devil? Do we look at him and we, we just scream in sheer terror? Do we burn with our intestines in lava and, and, and uh, at 5,000 degrees? Do our eyes fall out their sockets and do we feel all this pain is this really a feeling that we have can we feel in hell can we feel in heaven are our sense organs working do we actually have a body or is our soul free is it is it some sort of entity some sort of cloud um in which we're we're just this cloud of vapor that has some sort of consciousness and we're freed from bodily existence but we can potentially still experience in some dimensions can we maybe still eat in that manner? Can we still maybe have sex in that manner, even if we are just a cloud of vapour? Maybe we can. Maybe there's a way we can experience that, but that we don't experience the pain side of it if, let's say, we're in heaven. Um, if we're in hell, do we get poked repeatedly by little devils? What what do they torment us with? Do they torment us with our past lives on earth? Do we have past lives? Is that something that is the case? And does our soul reincarnate itself um, into another body and then after a certain number of bodies does then it get get allocated to heaven and hell maybe we need a hundred lifetimes on this planet and then the aggregate of those hundred lifetimes in, in terms of our morality in terms of what we did in terms of how we behaved maybe the aggregate of that then gets um, allocated towards heaven and hell dependent on those hundred lifespans what is it do we go to the Viking hell in which you're made to drink goat's piss? Or do we go to Valhalla and maybe we have fights in Valhalla and things like that? Where do we go? What happens? Do we go and sit with the Hindu gods? And do we watch the Vishnu Leela play out? Do we look at the earthly existence from now the place of the gods because we've ascended to that place? Where is it that we go into these different realms? Is it that these things 
things happen? Is it that these um, experiences are something beyond ourselves, are something real, or are they simply mythological stories? Are they nothing? Is it that we just go into nothingness? Is it that the atheists are completely correct? Is it that that is the, the case and that we are locked up forever in nothingness completely? And it's not even that we are locked up forever, but we're just nothing, completely nothing. And what does that mean? Does that mean that that's like sleep? And if that's like sleep, does that mean that sleep is nature's parallel of death so deep? It Does that mean that sleep is itself death? And does that mean that when we go to sleep, we wake up in a parallel universe that is exactly the same as the one that we fell asleep in, but that actually has been, we've been transferred to that parallel universe in which there's millions upon billions upon trillions of these infinite amounts of parallel universes that are playing out that every time we go to sleep we regenerate into another one of them and actually um, that means that in some way we have actually died and that the previous day's version of ourself is yes in line with the version of myself now but is it that actually there is a death that's happened there, or a transfer, or a teleportation that has happened there into another universe, because death and sleep are synonymous in some regard. Is it that when um, we, like the Buddhists say, when we attain some sort of state of nirvana um, in pure land Buddhism, we get to sit on the lotuses and we get to sit there in pure bliss and we, we absorb in reality just in, in this state of complete nerva kalpa samadhi and we are in perfect enlightenment, sat there on the lotuses all together, thousands of people on lotuses um, in the pure land. Is it that we become a hungry ghost? Is it that our mouths are too small and our stomachs are too large and we can't satisfy our hunger and that we're walking around and we want to eat and we want to eat but we can't satisfy our hunger and we feel tormented by this. We feel as if we want to satisfy our hunger but we can't do. We're, we're worried. We can't understand. We can't access um, that real deep hunger, that instinctual hunger that we need, that unconditional hunger that we must have. Is it that? Is it that our spirits get locked up in a hungry ghost and that we're walking around and we're made to walk around in such a fashion? Is it that we go to the Buddhist hell, the Azoras? Is it that we go to the, to the Devas? Is it that we go to the human realm once more? Is it that we go to the animal realm and do we experience the instinctual drives of the animals? What is it that happens? Where is it that happens? Is it like in dream time, like we do get the ecological changeabilities of consciousness? Where is it that we go? Is it that we get deposited back into rocks or back into this ether of universal energy? Is it that maybe we're deposited in uh, fruit and veg and fish and all these different things that, that uh, we now experience with our consciousness and we now absorb with our reality, but that obviously after our death, we are them again. What is it? Where is it? How is it? It's incredible. What is this flesh? What is this hand? Where does this come from? I don't understand. I don't have a clue. I don't understand it. I don't label it. I don't know it. But yet, it is here. In my reality, in a, an idea of stolopsism, which is the idea that everything around you is a product of your own mind, it is here in my own mind. I can, I can see it. I can touch it. I can observe it. And, and so it must be something because it must be at least a product of my own mind. Maybe it's my mind hallucinating all this. That's a very, very good theory at the moment. And so maybe it's my mind hallucinating all this. But what is it? I can still feel it. I can still experience it. There's something here. There's something here that's manifesting itself. It's playing itself. It's moving itself like a harmony of, of rhythm and music and dance and love and passion. What is it that is here? What is it that I experience? 
Um, is this a, sim a simulation? Is this biological subjectivity actually a falsehood? And is there actually an objective system behind it that is almost like a computer network that simulates our body and our physiology? And it gives us pain in a certain way as maybe some sort of game or maybe some sort of trick. We don't know. Maybe it's some sort of game or trick of some sort of higher entity or some sort of just autonomous and kind of... Um, sort of systematic computer system maybe it's something like that um and maybe um this pain and these experiences aren't really actually anything but simply just little electrodes or little bursts of energy going through a computer system maybe that's all it is maybe that's all the universe is is it that obviously there's some sort of multiverse and that there's all these different multiverses going in and out of each other and that all of the dreams that we have and all of the experiences that we have that we reject in our lives as conscious action go back into the unconscious through the unas mundas as i talked about with jung with the one world and go into another another one of the universes the multiverses and then has to go out into another person into the multiverse and actually pre present itself as an action in the multiverse so that then that thought can always be actionable and it can always manifest itself otherwise maybe uh, thoughts can't um, just not manifest themselves maybe thoughts have to manifest themselves but of course in this reality we can have a thought and it doesn't manifest itself so maybe it does have to maybe it goes back into another multiverse and maybe it has to action itself there what is this where is this? How is this? It's mental. It's crazy. It's in, it's weird. It's random. It's amazing. It's eccentric. It's beautiful. It's passionate. It's love. It's incredible. And um, youth don't think about that. And that's one of the, the stupidities of youth right there as well. The inability of youth to think. The inability of youth to abstract think. That's a folly. Now, um, I think that technology and computers and things like that are doing this more. Um, I don't really think too much it's the education system to blame. I think that that's my own prejudice against the, the education system talking. I think that actually the education system is um, okay. It's okay. Um, and it does allow people to abstract thinking in certain manners. Um, but... Um, you know, uh, people, people, young people, a lot of them don't abstract think. A lot of them don't think just in any way possible. Think this way, think that way, think left, think right, all the rest of it. There's a great Dr. Zeus uh, quote on that. Um, you know, the things you can think up, all, all that sort of stuff. Um, or the things, I think it's the things you can think up. Um, if you only try, you know, and, and thinking all these different ways and trying to, you know, whoa, what's this? Always? And you have these crazy imaginative ideas and you think, oh, look at that in my imagination. What's that doing? Oh, look, it's a Bam Bam Bishop. What's he doing with that heart? Oh, my God, he's whipping the heart. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. My heart's going, you know, so that, you know, you, you have imaginative fantasies and you, you, you can start to pull ideas and creatures out of your imagination as well and, and different ideas and different poetry out of your imagination, different stories out of your imagination and you're thinking up and you're, you're bubbling and there's this, there's this creative imagination factory going, there's this openness troop of imagination as I like to call it um, and it's beautiful, and it's passionate, it's wonderful and people, young people don't think like that and they don't you know, we don't have that beautiful flair, a lot of them, and it's it's a shame, and that's one of the, the, the parts of folly of youth as well, and the stupidity of youth. Um, unfortunately, uh, I have to end the video by saying a little statement to my older self, and I have to say that um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, and I mean that quite sincerely, because um, I know that you're not going to be accepting of me here, um, I know that when I'm 50 odd, if I get to that, or when I'm 70 odd, if I get to that and I look back on this video, which I might do, I might not, I know that you won't think I've done my best, but I try, I try so much. I, you know how much I try. You have my memories, you know what I've done. And, um, 
I know there's things that I have to do and I know there's things that I need to do to be good enough, not for anyone else, but to be good enough for who I am and to be good enough to present myself to the world as a person who can actually help people um, and can do good things. And I know that it might be hard for you to accept certain things that I didn't have um, or that certain experiences that weren't bestowed to me at certain ages. And I understand that it's hard for you to maybe grasp why right now I'm not doing certain things, maybe certain things I should be doing. I'm trying, I'm trying to do as much as I can at the moment at university. I'm trying to express myself as much as I can. I'm trying to help people. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to see. I'm trying to understand as best I can. But I know from your perspective, you will want me to do more. You will want me to try and see more. And what I mean by more is actually less. You want me to do less because you don't want me to have a compulsion to be trying to do X number of things. But what instead you want me to do is to slow down and to think of how I'm doing things in a in a in a more emotional manner. That's what you want. I know that. And um, I think about you all the time. I want you to know that I think about me at 75 or me at 55 all the time. And I try to understand what you want. Uh, I understand that you want me to be happy and you want me to slow down and to be considered and not to read things that I'm just reading for the sake of reading or I'm trying to do things for the sake of idolization or trying to um, be someone just to be someone. I know that what you want fundamentally is for me to be the genuine expression of personality and the individualized expression of personality that I need to be. Not that I want to be, not that I strive to be in some sort of egoic manner, but that I need to be that who I am. And that means, from my point of view, from my perspective here at 25, a sacrifice, a getting rid of certain things that I want to cling to. And um, I'll try. I want you to know that I'll try to to get rid of those things. I'll I'll... I'll move forward the best I can and um, I want to get to you. I want to realise you um, as someone whole, as someone accepting, as someone kind, as someone strong as well, as someone passionate, as someone eccentric, of course, because that's my myth in life. Um, but I, I want to get to you and I'm going to do that in the way that I do that. I was going to say the way I want to do that or the way I need to do that, but I'll just do that in the way I'll do that. I, I can't have any control particularly over it. It'll, it'll manifest based on external circumstances and my arising to those external circumstances in the way it will manifest. I don't have 100% control over it, although, of course, I will try my best to to learn and to orient things in, in the best way I can with whatever control I may have. Um, and so I will get to that and I will get to that for you and I will get to that um, to help if I can. And um, I know that I might not be able to help. I know that I might not be able to help gain some sort of balance back that we've, we've, we're losing quickly in the 21st century. But if I can just be even a tiny little beacon of light that may help people through the 21st century and, and, and get rid of some people's anxiety and some people's fear um, in whatever manner that takes, in whatever 
form that takes in terms of a, a, a career, in what I do, uh, whether it be helping people just by poetry and by um, bestowing people poetry that which I don't feel I've, I've done at the moment yet, quite yet, but maybe bestowing people poetry that helps them accept life and accept presence and accept kindness and, and all that sort of stuff. Or whether I do that through psychology and through helping people in a more direct way and in a more uh, familiar way with regards to uh, a neurosis or psychosis and things like that and being able to help them through those things. I, I can only ever be myself. I can only ever realize you as you are now, as you are watching this. And because um, you're already here watching this, you're here watching this now. And so by that logic, I, I always have to become you. And so um, I'll try and make sure that it's a good one. And I'll try and make sure that I don't go down um, the wrong path which is hard but I'll try to understand the follies and I'll try to make sure that I can accept while at the same time overcome those follies and be able to realize a sage rather than anything negative um so I think that's all I need to say. I think that's all I need to say on the folly of youth. I'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much for watching, guys. Um, I know it was another long one. I thought it would. I thought it would be a short one because I've got to go. Well, don't know whether we will be going now because I've not got a watch. All all of these jokes are the best. The oldest ones. I always do that one. If you've watched the channel for a long time, you'll know I do that. It's a ter it's a terrible joke. Um, we are meant to be going to the supermarket, but it's actually 11.42 right now, and the supermarket closes at 12, so I don't know whether we'll be going. We've done it before. We've done it before at 11.42. We've gone down there, but um, no, you know, uh, we'll see. We'll see, right? Um, so, yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, I did think it would be a short one because I thought we'd, I'd get a knock on the door saying we're going, but um, we're okay anyway. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of the folly of youth or the, the stupidity of youth, if you were, if you will. There's obviously more to discuss on it, but that kind of covers it in a, in a good amount. Um, you could talk about the folly of youth for about six hours or more um, if you really want to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into it. You could talk about um, behaviour expressed in terms of health behaviours, of um you know, uh, well, we've touched, actually, we have kind of touched upon that a little bit uh, earlier on. Um, so I suppose I've kind of somewhat given my philosophy on that anyway. Um, but we could also go go to the extent of, of, of course, like people um, overly indulging. These days, I think it's more prevalent as well with the advent of technology and um, with these apps, you know, these delivery apps that people get and um, they can get pizzas delivered all the time. I think it's becoming more prevalent in terms of health behaviour of, of young people. And, and again, this comes into the folly of youth um, and the discipline and the lack of, again, that's something else we could touch upon, the lack of discipline in, in youth as well. Um, but I think that comes into it in, in which um, there's this instant gratification and there's this kind of, well, I'm going to buy this pizza now, I'm going to get it delivered, I'm not going to have to get up, or I mean, basically all I'm going to have to do is get up to walk to the door to, to get it. Um, and so there's this kind of instant gratification, this kind of not having to do much work for anything, um, for for any level of success. And um, and then we, we, we get that, and, and of course we, we go round like that, and they, they reinforce the behaviour, and they're, they're eating bad every other night, and they're doing these things, and uh, technology has a role to play. And most of the things I've discussed, actually, in the 21st century, we are a generation, and I'll be read readily uh, one to admit it, we are a generation that is um, lazy and very, very, um, I don't know, just just kind of this, depend we're a dependent generation as well. We're lazy and we're dependent. They're two, two things of our generation, really. Um, and so... 
I think that that's a folly of youth as well, this kind of... Because if you have the discipline, if you can train yourself with discipline in youth, then you can get over those things and, and such like that, and you can start to organise your life in a certain way. Now, I'm not really one to talk at the moment. I'm not much of an example because my bed's a mess. Um, and, well, my floor's actually a bit better today. So, you know, that's okay. Um, but Saturday is my cleaning day and fri it's Friday's today. So, of course, Friday's always going to be the, the day where the, this room is full of the most yin energy. And uh, it's all messy and chaotic and stuff. Although we're not doing too bad because I did have a little mini tidy up yesterday on stream on Thursday Talks. Um, so, yeah, um, it's not too bad. Um, but there we go. I think that that is, is the case. You know, I think that's something that we could have touched upon. And there's so much more, you know, you dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into this. Um, and it's very, very interesting, you know, but I'll leave it there because one hour and 15 I mean, God, the amount, I could just philosophize on one tiny little thing and uh, it goes off into about a million different directions. I'm like, oh yeah, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool. And you think, oh, right, well, okay, bloody hell, well, well, there we go, that was that. Enjoy, you know, that's the eccentricity coming through. So um, I'll leave it there, guys. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one. So see you very soon.